so um, when I say the word the heart to you, uh, what comes to mind? When I say the word heart, what kind of images or connotations come to you specifically? Could it be like this heart right here, the classic one that we see on Valentine's Day, the one that's written in Hallmark cards that you, you self-taught yourself in kindergarten and brag about it for the next 17 and a half years? Or could it be this type of heart for all my science nerds? What this one in your Bio 11 textbook, the classic one with the whatever, like four chambers, two ventricles, aortic valve. Um, but what about the word heart in the Bible? When we look in the Bible, and the Bible speaks about the word heart over 800 times, and so it gives us a clue that is super important to God and his heart. But when he talks about the heart, what does he mean? How is it described? What does it look like? And I don't think God is talking about the heart like in the first two examples. When I see God talking about the heart across Scripture in the Bible, this is what I picture. Does anyone know what show that is? Star If anyone says Star Wars, I'll... Star Trek. Star Trek, baby, is the USS Enterprise. And when I was racking my brain on trying to figure out how can I describe the word heart to you in, in Scripture form, this is the best I can come up with. Now, don't base your theology on this picture. Let me explain. This specific picture right here is from Star Trek. This is the USS Enterprise, and this is specifically the bridge. And at the, at the center of the bridge, we have Chris Pine, uh, Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk, okay? And, and why do I put this picture up? It's because the commands and the critical thinking, the mistakes, the troubleshooting, the errors, it all falls on him. And the reason why I wanted to pick this picture to describe the heart is because um, it all revolves around who is on the captain's seat. Because like, who is on the captain's seat dictates your intellect, your will, emotions, thoughts, feelings, everything. It all kind of derives from that center point of the picture of the bridge. And so my question for you tonight is, who is, metaphorically speaking, who is on the captain's seat of your heart? Now, a lot of us in this room, especially if you are a Jesus follower or a Bible believer, you would definitely rhyme off, Jesus, he's, yes, Jesus is always the answer. He, he has my heart. He can take the wheel and everything. But if we look closely at the inventory of how we live our lives and, and our heart, I think, I think we may find sometimes that Jesus may not be on the captain's seat of our heart. Like if you're hot-tempered all the time and easily angered, then you might want to double-check to see who's on the captain's seat of your heart. If you come to the project just simply to seek out the next guy or girl you're going to sleep with, then you might want to double-check who's on the captain's seat of your heart. If you come to the project and you're kind of fed up with the teaching, how it's so shallow, but yet you're not even living out that shallow teaching, you may want to double-check to see who's on the captain's seat of your heart. And so if you are newer to our community, um, we are in a collection of talks right now called Rhythms, and we are essentially talking about something called spiritual disciplines. And spiritual disciplines are like these orders that we put around our lives that don't actually put a lid on things, but it actually sets us free to live life to the fullest. And it's fascinating because... A lot of people who look at the church and they, 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 they point their fingers and point out that the boundaries or the parameters or the fences, it kind of boggles down our freedom. They think that uh, Christianity and following the way of Jesus is restrictive, but actually as a matter of fact, the way of living like Jesus is not restricting, but actually meant for you to soar, to be free, to fly. Spiritual disciplines provide actually um, uh, the solution to what a lot of self-help books actually offer you anyways. If you were to walk down the aisles of Indigo and look at all of the best-selling self-help books, you can boil it down to three major points that they try to communicate to you. It's either uh, practice gratitude, practice generosity, and practice positive relationships. Do you see the common denominator there? Like nothing is new that these authors are telling you everything was first originated and written down in Scripture. And so I think it's safe to say that the teaching of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, ought to be looked at more, not as a bottleneck religion, but the legitimate answer to the human problem. 
You see, every spiritual discipline um, that we've talked about so far in this series, like fasting and silence and solitude and celebration, they're not just spiritual, but they seep into every single aspect of our lives, whether there are memorable moments or just the mundane moments. And tonight, I want to take a look at the discipline of worship, of worship. And worship in most times can be put into this box, um, only kind of categorized in the medium of music, the songs that we sing, but it's so much more than that. See, everyone worships. Whether you believe it or not, or whether you are a Christian or not, everyone worships something or someone. And worship at the time, uh, when we're worshiping, we are becoming. When we're worshiping, we are becoming something or someone. And the question I want to propose to you tonight is, are we worshiping the right thing or the right person? Now, the opposite of this is actually something we're going to read in the Bible here in just a second from a specific um, portion of Scripture. And what we're going to read is a passage uh, that is directed to a church in Corinth. And this is Paul, the author, and here in this church, they've had the, this, this, some bad stuff happen, and Paul is coming, the author, and he's trying to bring correction and bring him back on track, and they have switched their way of thinking into worshiping God to worshiping the things that God has created. So the opposite of worship is what we call idolatry, and this is what the Bible has to say about it. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, so my dear friends, Flee, run from the worship of idols. You're reasonable people. Like, you have common sense. Think about it. Decide for yourselves if I'm, what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we will all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? So what am I trying to say to you? Am I, not, am I saying that food offered to idols has significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that all these sacrifices are offered to demons, not God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. If you would follow down scripture a few verses to verse 23, it says, You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. And then finally, going down to verses 32 and 33, it says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I, too, try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others, so that others and many might be saved. So let's just kind of take it back and break it down for a second here. There's a chunk of people who are distorting what it means to worship. This church that Paul is writing to has begun really well. They've kicked off their race super fast. Momentum is going. But they've gone from worshiping the creator to now worshiping the creation. See, they used to have passion for him. They used to acknowledge him. They used to put him at the center. They used to worship him and use that influence to affect the city around them. But it's not about God anymore. The honeymoon is over, and now things are getting tough. Things are getting a little difficult. And it's not about God anymore. It's about whatever is nice, whatever is new, whatever is sexy, shiny, whatever is the easy way out. See, what was once God on the throne on the captain's seat of their hearts, is now replaced by an idol. Now you might be thinking, Reuben, what do you mean by an idol? Well, this is the best definition I can give you for idolatry. Idolatry is this, if you're writing it down. Anything in your heart that takes priority over God. It's essentially what it is. Anything in your heart that takes priority over God. Now why do I mention the heart so many times at the beginning of the message? Don't all things kind of start with your mind or start with your thoughts or your intellect? And I would agree with you. It, would, it, it could sometimes come from your mind, but it's dictated from your heart. It all flows from the heart. Check out what it says in Scripture in Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the source of life. Now, that's Old Testament language. Let's move to the New Testament. This is coming from the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 15. He says, for from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. 
Why am I putting so much emphasis on this? Because if there's anything in our heart or in our lives that take priority over God, it causes a lid. It causes a ceiling. And there's a couple things that idolatry leads towards. Number one, idolatry or idols can bring a spiritual ceiling. And two, it can bring spiritual deception. But here's what I mean by that. Let me explain. Number one, idols can bring a spiritual ceiling. I know for a fact, and I, know, I don't know everyone in this room personally, but I'm pretty sure I can say this with confidence, is that everybody in this room, and I'm, I'm talking to you, everyone in this room, I know, has a plan and destiny in their lives to do something magnificent. To, to, it will blow your minds. Your purpose and destiny, you actually took time to acknowledge it. And it goes beyond you, it goes beyond your friends, and it goes beyond your family. You have the potential, my friends, young adults in this room, you have the potential to be the spitting image of who Jesus is and potentially be the answer to someone else's prayer. And this, is back, this past week, I was reading through, um, out of all the websites, Reddit, but for a good reason. Uh, I was reading through Reddit, and uh, I was, I was kind of combing through some different posts from different universities across Edmonton. And I was just so heartbroken and so sad that in these posts from U of A to McEwen to Nate to whoever, that the common denominator in all of these posts is that there are people every single day posting about how someone is lonely. In a campus of U of A of, of, of 40,000 students, that someone is lonely, craving for a friendship, just want someone to hang around with. So you in this room, you have the solution to that problem. Now, you may not be friends. You don't have to be friends with absolutely everybody, but everyone is not just looking for a friendship. That's like the first level. That's just scraping the surface. It goes beyond that. They're looking for a type of relationship that only Jesus can satisfy. And you are the ones who are able to bring and affect that chain, that change. But when you hit a ceiling, <clears throat> it's hard to break through. When you have idols in your life, meaning things that can kind of take priority over God, whether it's like your job, your, your, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your sports, your schooling, finances, whatever it may be, it could actually develop a barrier between you and God. And this might be a tough pill to swallow, but like you are only worth the value of the idols you bow down to, right? You are only worth the value of the idols you bow down to. We all bow down to something, whether it's like God the king or something else. But when you bow down, you bring yourself to what we call submission to that thing or person. And, do- and therefore, you have the potential to draw whatever they have offered back. See, what- whatever you draw yourself to, you will draw yourself back. A famous a smart person named Ralph Emerson said this. He said, a person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute Is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will out. It will come out. That which determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we're also becoming. And so if you draw yourself towards gossip, gossip's going to be just drawn back towards you. If you draw yourself to parties and alcohol, you're just going to get a hangover and a bunch of regrets. And so, but when you draw yourself to Jesus... He promises us freedom. He promises a purpose and a destiny and a centered life. And this is what us Christians are striving to to, to run towards, to walk towards. So that's the first thing. It can bring a spiritual ceiling. But the second thing is that it can bring spiritual deception. Now, this is what I mean by that. Whenever things like fear or lust or pride starts to take place on the throne of our hearts, so that captain seat, then whatever your view is of life, whether that's right or wrong, what's God's way or not God's way, become very blurred. So blurred that we start to sin and make sin uh, presumptuously. And this is what I mean by presumptuously. Now, don't raise your hand, but have you ever thought to yourself, hey, I know this is wrong, but God will forgive me. I know I've been there. I have. You probably have. They have. The Church of Corinthians. And so when you start assuming on the grace of God as if it is this cheap thrill that did not have an eternal payment attached to it, God is saying to the Church of Corinthians, you are now cheapening the greatest sacrifice that was ever made in history. Now, most people today wouldn't physically say that with their lips and with their mouths, but they do with their lives. We do with our hearts. Like, if I do this, it's okay. 
God will forgive me. It's all about grace, baby. Like, and Paul is saying to this church in, Cor- in Corinth, hey, you on thin ice and you heavy. <laughs> Got these cool glasses here. See, when, when this, okay, get over it. <laughs> see, deception will allow you to not see things in its true colors. As you can see right now, I've got a tint over my eyes. And I, when I put this on, I can't see right off the bat, I can't see things in its proper form because this blue tint is just covering everything up. And if we're not careful, this tint, when it's on for so long, will start to become my new reality. And some of us are getting into relationships with this tint on. Like all your friends are thinking, hey, yo, red flags, but you're, you got this on. Or some people are just like, they're reading Instagram posts and self-help posts instead of reading the Bible and what God has to say about things. People are telling you, hey, go back to the Bible, go back to the Word. But you're thinking, no, Oprah or Kanye or Jordan Peterson has heard from God already, so I'll just listen to them. See, if you're not careful, deception can start to blur your perspective. And you'll make every important decision in your life based on this perspective. So, how, how do we turn away from this? Like, how, what is the solution and the antidote to this issue? Well, we see this type of language in both the Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, it says this in Ezekiel 14, 6. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord has said. Repent. Repent and turn away from your idols and stop doing all the mistakes you're doing. Stop doing the sinning. Even if you jump over to the New Testament, in Acts 3, it says, Now repent of your sin and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. What is the common denominator here? It's repent. And it's not a word. It's kind of like a churchy word. I get it. But don't let it scare you or kind of weird you out. It's actually a word to encourage you and give you hope. Repent just means to turn around. So if the, if the Bible is telling me to repent from my idols, that means if the idols that I'm looking at right now, it means I just need to do a 180, a 180 away from my idols. But as I'm walking away from my idols, I'm also walking towards something else. And the antidote to the worship of our idols is turning back our worship towards God himself. Now, when we hear the word worship, it's usually what? The first song? Before the message, or the two or three songs after the message we sing, we sing afterwards, we think that worship is a song or a tempo, but worship is just so much deeper than that. This is the best definition I can give you um, for worship. It's on the screen. It says, worship, worship is our love expressed to God as a response to his grace toward us. Worship is the only thing that we can do. We cannot repay back God for for salvation. We cannot repay back God for what he's done in our lives. But the thing the Bible talks about over and over again is that the most sweetest gift, the most pleasant scent, is the gift of worship. See, worship entangles everything we are. It's It's the thankfulness. It's the awe. It's the reverence. It's the submission, the joy, commitment, all together in one. So we can't just worship in just two to three songs in the middle of the service. It's so much more than that. And so if worship is more than just the songs we sing, it has to be our lifestyles. It's not just the songs we sing. It's the lives we eventually live. Check it out in Deuteronomy 11. It says this about our lives and worship. It says, you must love the Lord your God and always obey the requirements, decrees, regulations, and commands. Okay, we got that so far. Let's move on down a little bit to verse 13. If you carefully obey the commands I'm giving you today, and if you love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and soul, then he will send the rains in their proper seasons. Going down to verse 22 as we end off. Be careful to obey all these commands I'm giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his ways and holding tightly to him. So, if we're running away from idolatry to true worship, and we know that true worship isn't just a few songs that we sing, then what do we need to learn about what true worship is? As we kind of land the plane tonight, it's just three quick things. Number one, true worship is, is through obedience. 
It's through obedience. It's, it's all the moments that come before you where there's a choice. The choice to choose yes to God's word and his teaching or say yes to the other. It's in those moments where worship is reflected onto God and also onto other people. It's when you say yes to generosity or to help or to stand up for something God would stand up for. That in itself is an act of worship. Two, um, true worship is through expression. And this is where the music, uh, the medium of music comes in. You know, I wasn't saying that worship song isn't worship. It's a form of worship. It's an expression of worship, which is a beautiful thing. And we see David in the book of Psalms, which is a book full of worship songs, and he breaks it down himself. He says in Psalms 89, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. In Psalms 132, he says, sing to him. Sing praise to him and tell of all of his wonderful acts. See, music is just a medium. But through the medium of music, worship is expressed. If it's true worship, it has to be expressed. See, whether you're a believer or not, um, you may look around this room, and during worship, you may see people kind of close their eyes, or they're, they're raising their hands while worshiping. It's nothing weird or crazy. It's simply they're expressing their worship through surrender. I raise my hand sometimes because I know that Jesus did so much for my life. And all I can do is just, my hands just go like this. I'm like, wow, God, like you're so good. You're so great. All I can do right now is just surrender to you. Now, does that mean that you have to raise your hands? Of course not. But I will say that worship needs to be expressed in one way or another. It could be music as a medium or it could be like anything else that gives glory to God, the arts, whether it's music or, or paint or dance, etc. And a lot of people, I know I, I, I have some conversations with young adults sometimes, and they feel a little, they feel a little afraid and a little awkward and, and kind of weirded out to like raise their hands and worship because they think it looks weird or they think it looks lame. Like, have you seen people try to find Wi-Fi? Like, oh my gosh, dear Jesus, please, like absolutely moronic or trying to find a battery charger when there's 10% left on their battery oh my gosh I'm gonna die or like going to an Oilers game I saw someone like just pour beer on himself like so what are the expressions of worship this bunch but five quick examples that we see in scripture one we see sometimes people bow down in reverence and Psalm 95 it says come let us bow down in worship let us kneel before the Lord our maker. We see some people lift their hands, as we mentioned before, in adoration. Psalm 63, it says, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift my hands. Sometimes we dance in celebration. Last week we got to do that with baptisms. Psalm 95, let him praise his name with dancing. That's super cool. Four, sometimes we worship with a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, knowing that our worship isn't just based on our circumstances, but it's based on who he is, right? Like, I don't worship God to get something or what he, what he can do for me. I worship God because of who he is. And finally, five, we lay down our lives as an act of worship. Got this from a pastor in Romans 12. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true and proper worship. Again, worship isn't just songs that we sing here. It's the lifestyles. Worship continues after we leave these doors tonight. And finally, three, true worship is through serving. Oh man, Rubes can give another plug about joining team or volunteering. Hear me out. Jesus role model serving. It clearly says in, in, in Philippians 2, it says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Because of that, therefore, God has elevated him to the place of highest honor gave him the name above all names, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, 
in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So the purpose of this verse is to illustrate how pushing the kingdom of God forward doesn't come from the moments on stage. It doesn't come from the person who speaks in the mic. It's those who roll up their sleeves and get to work. It's to use what we know from our head and our hearts to use then in our hands. See, the project where you are right now will never be a place where the prosperity gospel will be taught. Meaning, like, if you don't know what that is, like, if you accept Jesus, he's going to make it rain on you. Like, no, that's not, that's not what we're going to tell you here. But we're also not going to be preaching the poverty gospel where, like, you have to absolutely get rid of everything. Go all Amish and churn your own butter. What we are going to preach about, and this is the heartbeat of the project, is the generosity gospel, the serving gospel. It's where we acknowledge how God has been good to us. He has blessed us. He's given us everything we need. And in that posture, we will now go to the bottom of the totem pole and push God's plan forward, God's kingdom to be expanded. See, I don't want to come to the project and come and sit there and stand there with my arms crossed thinking, how was worship? But instead ask the question, how was my worship? I don't want to come to the project and ask, you know, what can God do for me? But ask, what can I do for God and for this church? See, upon salvation, I mean, the moment that you accepted Jesus into your heart, you and I have received everything we need for this present life and for the, the, the future life. We now live a life, friends, where it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And now some of you attend other churches in the morning and call that home, and that's so awesome. But a lot of you in this room call the project your home, and you've been coming here for years, and you have not really done anything to stretch or done anything with your faith. You come in and out, seeking something, then leaving, and then complain if nothing is meant for you. If that is you, it's a tough pill to swallow, but I, I say this with absolute love. It's time for you to step up. It's time for you to take, to, to take a leap of faith and risk and do something with your faith. You see, when I, when I, I speak to our volunteers, our serve team and leaders, I often say in pre-service prayer that projects are home. It's a beautiful thing. A home is where you come and you let your guard down and you find rest and comfort and you can come as you are. But a home is also a place where you got to clean it. You got to work at it. You got to invest into it. So I'm saying a next step for you is to possibly just get into serving and to help project and propel the project forward. All the project can do is just to create the environment and the avenues where people can come and meet Jesus because we will never stop preaching the gospel and the good news. But he, here's the thing, you know, five staff members can't do that. But you know what can make a difference? 500 young adults who call the project home can make that happen. You see, I know and I believe in my heart that God has a plan. No matter what. By the end of the day, you can take that to the bank. God has a plan. It's going to happen one way or another. And I, for one, do not want to miss out on what I can bring to the kingdom of God. I want to be old and gray with my wife and look back on my life and not see a stack of regrets, but a stack of moments where we're like, man, remember that time we took that risk? We took that leap? That was stupid, hey? But God came. God moved. And it was really cool and really special. That's what Christianity can offer. That's what Christianity can bring into your lives. Now, I want to live my life in worship, not only through music, but I also want to live through worship through my marriage. I want to live through obedience, through the big things and the, and the small things, and to allow my, my head, my heart, and my hands to work together to allow Jesus to become super known in our community of Edmonton. See, serving through worship will bring an incredible solution for you running away from your idols. Because here's the thing, it's that you're not catering to yourself anymore. You're now depending on God for everything and on God himself. You see, we dream and we picture in this room, in this, in this auditorium, we dream 
in the future to see students from U of A, from McEwen, from Nate, Concordia, Norquest, wherever you go to come into these seats and, and, and working singles and working relationships and working families to come not just to put butts to a seat, but to have a space and an environment where people can come and meet Jesus and, and accept salvation and just understand the greatest love story ever told. But a few staff members can't do that. A few hundred young adults can do that, though. And so would you join me in that? Would you join us in this journey to take that leap of faith, to go out and, and, and worship him, not only in a couple of songs that we're going to sing right now, but also continue to worship him, whatever that may look like when you cross these doors outside tonight. I know that Jesus has a plan for the project. Yes, on Sunday nights, I'm excited for it to see what that looks like. But I'm also excited to see what God has planned for you individually as young adults. And so will you choose? Will you choose to run away from idols and live a life of worship? If that is you, then hey, take that step. And I'll give some instructions at the end of the night. But I'm so excited for you. As a part of the staff of the project, I'm excited for you and your future and what God has planned for you. And we believe, you know, coming through the summertime, it's really fun and exciting. And when it comes to the fall, we're going to be sprinting at that thing and just see young adults come and find uh, a place uh, at the project to find home here and come as they are and accept Jesus for the very first time, which is something that we all want to do, right? And if that's you in, in this room, maybe you got invited by a friend here tonight and you're kind of hearing what the way of Jesus is like and what the way of following uh, Christianity is like. And if, if you're there and you're thinking, hey, I want to know more about that or I want to actually dive in and, and see what it's like to walk and live as a Christian, and I want to pray for you in just a, a couple seconds here. But all in all, our heartbeat is not call the project as this place with like lights and smoke and loud music, but a place where Jesus is so at the forefront. He's so evident and that he will just allow us to live how we're meant to live. So may we live lives of worship, not in this weird, creepy way where we're like only like waving flags during music time, but may it be in like the Wednesday morning when we're going to school, that Thursday afternoon when you're in customer service and you want to ring out this customer what will you choose? Worship affects those moments as well. And so in that, I'm going to invite you to stand with me right now, and I would love to pray over you. I want to pray over you in terms of what does worship look like for you, and, and even if you're in this room and um, maybe you, accept, you want to accept Jesus for the very first time, I want to pray for you, but I also want to let you know that when I leave this stage, there's going to be a prayer team that's going to come to the front here, some guys and girls, and, and if you want to come and pray with them, they would be more than happy to pray with you. And so guys, find a guy to pray with, and girls, find a girl to pray with. They would love just kind of, you know, just show some love and just lift you up to Jesus. So let's pray, and then we're going to go into time, a time of worship, and this is, a, if you're new here or never been to the project before, this is what I'm talking about. It's a medium of music where we can express our worship in such a beautiful and unique way. But let me pray for you, and I'll, I'll leave it to the band to continue on. So, Jesus, we thank you for our moments together, and we thank you for just what you're doing on Sunday nights. We thank you for the young adults that are coming in and just really taking a leap of faith in what worship looks like and what it ought to look like. For those in this room who are coming in with this huge weight on their shoulders, I pray for them that they would, that they would lean into you more and depend on you more. I pray, God, for those in this room who perhaps want to take the step for the very first time to accept you, salvation, the greatest love story ever told, right here, right now. I pray for them in Jesus' name. I pray that you would just enter into their lives, that you would enter their souls, and that they would confess and believe that you are the Savior of their lives, that you are the Son of God. We believe that you lived, you died, and you rose again. And we put our faith and our trust in you. So as we worship, may it just be towards you because of what you've done in our lives. May we worship as a reflection and as a response for how good you are and the grace that you first showed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.